um, sustainable. And so, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Crystal. Let's have Ganga introduce. Ganga Devi, can you tell us how you got started into this and something that touched your, your heart in, in the work that you do? Yes, yeah, so um, thank you. I'm so moved to be here with all of you here and all of you here on this panel. Um, so my name is Ganga Devi Braun. I was uh, born and raised um, in what we call Florida on the Treasure Coast in the United States, which is um, unceded, occupied uh, in territory in Turtle Island. Um, and I was raised in, in an incredibly pluralistic, uh, futuristic kind of environment. I was raised um, on an ashram <laughs> on Turtle Island uh, that had temples to Jesus and the Buddha, as well as many Hindu deities. Um, we had beautiful gardens that were the foundation of our uh, of our of our religious life um, that my mother and my father had planted as founders of the community, um, and we also, uh, as a community, were very service oriented. We um, began really thriving. The community really formed at the peak of the AIDS crisis in the United States and in the world um, in the in the 80s. And so my whole childhood was spent um, helping to hospice people who were who were dying of AIDS and. Um, Many of my earliest childhood friends were, were older uh, people, you know, not very old, but uh, older than me as a child, uh, who were, it was short-lived friendships because they were dying. Um, but that experience with death uh, made me much more cognizant of the value of life from a very early age. Um, and I was just, I've always been so curious about, you know, how can we live a meaningful life with whatever time we do have? Um, and I've sought to answer that question in many different ways. I've been involved in, um, for a time I was really just focused on social justice work. And then for a while I was really just focused on permaculture work. And um, in the last few years I've discovered a really beautiful synthesis of ecological, social, spiritual, and consciousness work. Um, and my main teacher is, uh, similarly to Alex, the soil compost. Um, I'm really passionate about understanding how, how we can work with everything that has ever existed, um, our ancestors, our ancestral trauma, um, the, the systems that we live in today already, and use all of what we have at our disposal right now um, as compost, not rejecting any of it, not labeling any of it as evil, but maybe some of it, uh, it's time for it to to be digested and to be metabolized into, into something new. So everything I do is framed as a regenerative ethos, a, an ethos of uh, working with what has come before and uh, evolving it into something that is uh, new and more beautiful. And um, if I may share a little story uh, that without going too much into um, the politics of it, I think we can all acknowledge that the, the day after the election in the United States in 2016 was a significant moment um, and a shock to many people. And I didn't really know what, what world I was living in. I didn't know what to expect of the future. I sensed that a lot of chaos was coming and I didn't know quite what to do. Um, so that morning uh, we, was one of the days that in my community we have a free permaculture class for anyone in the community to come and, um, and experience and learn together. And I went today that day as a student and um, the, the lesson that day was all about compost. And we went around to every single house on the ashram in every single communal household and we collected the food scraps that they had been uh, accumulating in the, the last few days, uh, which was a lot of food scraps. And um, we brought it to the area where we do the composting and we, we contributed all of this waste to a new bin of, um, of decomposing life. And then we went and we, um, we worked with an older, uh, an older pile from the compost that had been from, from weeks before that had been hot and full of life. And there was, there was incredible heat and, and chaos, but life potential held there. And um, then we went and took some complete soil that was ready to be uh, brought into the food forest, into the trees. Um, and we sorted, we, we sifted it, we, we prepared it. We, rec we saw how alive and how, um, how, well, it held integrity. If you made a ball of it in your hand, um, you could hold that ball and you could hand it to someone and it would sh keep, keep that shape. It wasn't just the sandy soil of the land that we normally live. It was full of life. 
um, full of possibility. And then we went and we offered it to the trees and we, we said prayers. And I realized that in that moment, that was one of the deepest lessons of the potential of, of decay and chaos and systems changing into certain aspects of our reality, dying and falling away. And um, I felt the possibility of the future in a way that I think is really necessary for all of us to feel moving into, um, moving into whatever is coming in our world. We are guaranteed chaos. We are guaranteed the heat of the compost pile. We're, we're in it right now. And, um, and if we understand how to respond to it, how to work with all of the raw materials, we can create something beautiful and life affirming. So that's the foundation of my work. I think it's a great example of how you processed that, in that experience. It's like soil was healing your soul, <laughs> and you took that experience, and literally nature taught you how to work through that. That's really beautiful, Ganga Devi. All right, Elias, can you share with us your journey? What brings you to do the work that you do? Um, maybe I can put it into a story. And I think it's important to know where I'm growing up. I grown up in a kind of a fortress. It's called Europe. And <clears throat> at the beginning of my life, I didn't know it's a fortress. Um, it's uh, in my, at the beginning of my life. It uh, was an open, wide land, full of um, opportunities. But my whole life long, it doesn't felt that good to be there, to live in this place because it doesn't felt that righteous. Um, uh, but yeah, and as I grow older, I recognize more and more problems in the world and I see the walls around the country I live in, the imaginable walls, you can't touch them, they're also just in our heads. And um, I learned that the country I live in uh, has an economic economy based on robbery and um, robbing other countries, people, or the nature. So I um, recognized I'm living in a um, kind of um, robbing economy. And um, as I recognized that, I started to, to search about alternatives. How could be living be instead of um, this fear and anger, um, we have to put walls around us to save us from the people we rob. And I found a lot of uh, opportunities uh, in my community, um, which are not um, uh, of my blood, um, but um, it's my family and my heart. So there's a lot of opportunities in this world, and we have all the solutions we need to face climate change to uh, face all the social problems, I think we have the most of the solutions right now in the, by the people. And another um, moment in, I'm, I'm life, in my life, I recognized uh, something goes wrong uh, was the moment as I started to um, being active uh, for for um, the environment on a very legal way. So, uh, and I recognized there are a lot of um, borders which the government sets to me um, in which space I can act, what I can do. And it felt, it always felt like I can do nothing. It doesn't mean anything what I'm doing because I'm in a fortress and on the border of my fortress drowning people into the sea because we robbed their, their opportunities to live in their own land. 
So uh, <clears throat> I, get, I started um, with, with uh, climate activism um, and um, now I'm being part of the climate justice movement in Germany and we um, try to address um, our wish to the world uh, on a very direct way. We blockade, for example, coal plants, energy plants, um, to show that's not um, the way we like to, um, energy is produced. Uh, yeah, and things like that. Just um, doing direct action, showing what uh, world we want to live in. Wonderful. Thank you, Elias. And I was speaking to El Elias earlier, and he was telling me how he's setting up a space in Germany where activists can come and stay. Because a lot of these activists, they're actually, they don't really have much money because they're giving all their time for this. No one pays them for this. And uh, you were sharing with me how, you know, they're often doing small jobs and side jobs, and they're living really simply because they're the conscience of our society, because we've lost that conscience. And just because something is legal doesn't mean it's moral. And you're really reminding us of that through the work that you do. So thank you so much. Wonderful. And I'd like to uh, invite Meher to also share. Go ahead, Meher. Hello, everyone. Uh, technically, I should, I have no business being here. Uh, <clears throat> because uh, I did my bachelor's in commerce, then my MBA in finance. Uh, I worked for a bank, then in stock markets. Uh, my mantra for life was speed and accuracy. I believed in infinite growth. And uh, I believed that growth is equal to prosperity. I distinctly remember going to a supermarket with my dad. And the supermarket was full. Uh, there were queues in the billing counter. And I told him that this is prosperity. A little I knew that I was wrong. That's in my past life. And what I do now is I uh, create computer models of social systems, ecological systems, how humans and nature interact with each other, and what emerges through that interaction. Because increasingly I'm realizing uh, you can talk about speed and accuracy, but life is a process of emergence. Uh, life is made up of non-living parts which interact with each other and creates an illusion of life which is a very emergent process. How the hell can I say that uh, speed and accuracy is the mantra for success? I'm increasingly realizing how little I know. And every time I read more, interact more with people, uh, that belief is, is reaffirmed. So life is full of uncertainty. And that's what I'm coming to terms with. However, my training was in management and management by objectives, controllability. Oh, yeah. You have to optimize the parts. Oh, yeah in order to increase the performance of the system. So you optimize people, you train them, get them the best infrastructure, laptops, SkyFi stuff. And if you do SkyFi, success is yours. Uh, that's a big lie, by the way. Uh, that's what I'm coming to terms with. But now working in the social space, and we do create computer models of social systems, and I'll come back to it later when I'm given a chance again to speak, uh, we are realizing how uh, this whole idea of engineering change is so flawed. We are in the business of engineering social change. That's a very engineering mindset. And when we talk about social change, we are dealing with people, we are dealing with groups of communities and environmental systems, which are full of non-linearity. They self-organize themselves, right? We hardly understand what is the purpose of a forest, of what is the purpose of a flock of birds. Uh, I hardly understand what is my own purpose but we are in the business of engineering social change and I find it very silly. Uh, so the recent realization which I was sharing with the group also is that how can we uh, live with change instead of engineering a change? And working on a, at an individual level has been very transformative for me. And I believe that if you can transform yourself piece by piece, bit by bit, step by step, and if all of us can transform our own selves, I think over time, over time, as we connect with each other, a societal transformation may emerge. Uh, but coming up with a view from a hierarchical mindset that there is authority which will create a policy which will enable a social change as an engineered process, uh, 
is a very difficult pursuit in case if we are in that pursuit. Or that realization is very hard to come to me. It took me a decade. Wonderful. So I'm going to get us all to elaborate a little bit more on the themes that we've touched upon. And I just want to share, I was in a school called Mirambika. It's a school where there was no curriculum. The kids decided what they wanted to study. Uh, because in this school, the, the idea came from Sri Aurobindo, a great spiritual teacher, who said that every child has within himself, herself, the curiosity to learn <laughs> and the ability to imitate. So we already have within us in intense curiosity and intense imitation. And then our entire education system seems to dismantle that. They say, don't do what I do, do what I say. <laughs> and don't ask so many questions, just listen to what I'm telling you, right? So we dismantle what's already there. So in this school, we did, did something very interesting. For one full week, the children were asked to imagine the future that they want to live in, which is kind of the topic that we have today, right? What kind of world do you want to grow into? So what is the housing like? What is the agriculture like? What is the justice like? What is the education like? And we were asked to imagine what kind of world that we wanted to grow in. And we were invited to write about it and paint about it and make poems about it and really imagine that future for ourselves. And after one week of this, and we all made our presentation, the teacher asked us, all right, so this is the kind of, if you want to make flying cars and if you want to have food for all and if you want to have this kind of world, then what kind of skills do you need to learn? And suddenly, if you want to make flying cars, physics made sense, mathematics made sense, chemistry made sense. Suddenly, all these subjects otherwise made no sense and getting marks made no sense. Suddenly, it made a lot of sense. So I want to invite all the panelists here to, uh, if, you want to if you have a vision, because I bet the work that you're doing is not just coming from uh, you know, some, uh, some, some theory. It's coming from some, somewhere deep inside you. You have a vision for the possibility for our world. And my invitation for you is, what for you are some of the key, key insights or the key ideas or the key images that keep you going and that perhaps can touch the lives of each one of us here today, right? Do you want to start, Ganga Devi? Yeah. I, I love that and I, uh, I just want to begin by inviting not just everyone on the panel here, but all of you, all of us in this room, in this moment. Uh, Close your eyes if it feels safe to do so. And just take a moment to imagine what um, Charles Eisenstein calls the more beautiful world your heart knows is possible. We're all here because there is some, some center of gravity, some dream, some vision, some experience perhaps of that more beautiful world that we've all had at some point in our lives that's come to us and that pulls us informs the best decisions we've ever made, informs the love and care and compassion that we cultivate for our communities and the world around us. No, I don't think any of us would be here in this room or in human bodies on the earth at this time without that pull, that draw. So for me, um, as I shared, I, I was born and raised in a very beautiful, idyllic environment, um, service-oriented, pluralistic, multicultural. Um, but it also has its own issues, as all human systems do. Um, and I... I suppose because I was raised um, in a model of the future that I saw was incomplete, I'm always very curious about how, how can we do better, even with that which is working pretty well. Um, and the way that the only satisfactory and helpful answers that I've ever found has always been through looking at how ecosystems thrive, looking at how nature thrives, looking at how um, different living beings support one another and encourage one another to thrive, nourish. One plant nourishes the soil for another plant, which provides um, a safe place for another species to create a family. It, it is all, the, the web of interdependence is so obvious when you look outside your window. 
So getting outside and allowing, allowing the living world to show me what it looks like rather than me imposing my idea of what I think it should be um, is a really, really important part of my own practice. Um, another element that I, that I find really important and uh, is really shapes a lot of the work that I do with individuals um, as, a, as a counselor uh, for regeneration, for building a regenerative culture, is working with uh, time and space. And so the process of, of understanding the world that we want to live in um, requires understanding the context that we live in now. So I begin with space, with place. I invite the people that I work with to understand where do you, where do you live now? Who, who were the people who lived there before, the people who look like you? What are the species that are indigenous to that land? And what are the species that maybe if they're not indigenous are thriving and contributing in a good way? How can we rethink how the role and the position and not only the purpose, but the meaning of everything that exists, where you are now? And then to connect with time, first with our own ancestors. Um, my ancestors come from Europe and uh, European people living in the fortress have been um, have been violently separated from indigenous knowledge for a very long time. And as we know, trauma perpetuates trauma. So if I imagine a world in which there is peace and harmony and flourishing of life, um, it's one in which we do really serious ancestral trauma healing. Um, all of us taking responsibility for that in ourselves and asking ourselves, what are the prayers of my ancestors? What, what were my ancestors praying for for me? And how can I live that prayer now? No matter what they faced, how can I step into a, a sacred relationship with myself and with time? And then, of course, looking into my descendants, looking into the future, looking into the world that I want to create. How can I be a good ancestor to all those who will come afterward? These are the kinds of questions that, that drive me and that shape my, my constant process of questioning what actually does the world that I want look like because one idea that I had four years ago, maybe it's realized somewhere in the world. Maybe I can go there and visit and learn from people about what's not working there and continuously be improving on that model. I think this constant process of, of inquiry and curiosity is absolutely essential. Um, so I'm driven really by asking good questions and noticing when my questions could be, could be better and serve healing more to, to revisit them and to be open to being wrong um, and to be open to the questions of others. So that's beautiful. a little bit of my process. Thank you, lovely, that's so beautiful. I'd like any of the other panelists to build on what Ganga Devi just shared. Just building on, um, for me, for making sure we live with compassion and think about all of our roles um, in all of the work that we're doing and how we can support each other in the work we're doing. Um, when I think about like the socially sound society and like the, the environment that you grew up in, and for most people that would be like ideal. So when you bring up that there were problems, you know, um, there's always problems in societies, um, but making sure that we have, we work together to get solutions um, and not think that one person is right and whatever that solution is. And so um, being open to listening to everyone, everyone's input, no matter where they come from, no matter um, their background, um, whatever their feelings are. So just think, thinking about um, you know, having that compassion and harmony as well, living in harmony um, with each other. Um, and I know like in the United States, we have a lot of issues as other countries as well. Um, you know, thinking about like just within communities, like living together in peace and harmony and thinking about um, ways that we can create a world where we all have clean water, where we all have 
access to land to grow um, what we need, where we have access to um, food, so, you know, sustainable, nutritious food that's culturally relevant. Um, and just making sure, um, I think with the, when I think about land and like having, making sure we all have sovereignty over what land, like so we have a lot of people who um, don't have access to land. Um, and that's not just in America, but that's all over the world. And having land is definitely power. Like you can do a lot with land. Land sustains us all. Um, land provides the food for us. And when we don't have um, the rich soil, like you're talking about compost is so important. Um, and I think about food waste, when you brought up the food scraps, I do a lot with um, trying to reduce food waste as well as using food that would be um, discarded. Um, showing people how to use that food, like, you know, that a lot of it that's because it has a blemish is still consumable. Um, and then if you're not going to eat it, then to compost it and let that energy go back into the soil, back into life and regenerate um, our land. And um, having healthy land also helps us have healthy water. And so all of that goes together, like making sure that we're taking care of um, not just the land, but all of the beings in the ocean. I think we forget about our, you know, the water, um, which is actually more important <laughs> probably than the land because we, like someone said earlier, like over 70% of our bodies made from water. And so we need to um, think about the con conserving our water, protecting our water, um, protecting all of the beings in the water, um, like when it comes to overfishing. Um, nice. I want to pollution. invite Elias to add to what you're saying. Sure. Yeah. Um, for myself, uh, is living with the land uh, one of the most important things. Um, when I speak from uh, seven generations in the future, I hope I will um, live from the land and with the land I live on. Um, and, and that's very uh, important for me that no one has to tell the people w uh, which I live with what uh, we have to do. Just um, the people I live with um, decide what we do with our land, with the land of everyone. Um, yeah, it's more the world I, I will live in is a world where um, very much small communities live together, um, organize themselves and um, go in exchange um, with the other small communities which are spread all over the world. And there's no, um, no hierarchical system where I'm an, at, the, at the ground and have nothing to tell. It's um, um, the power in the fut in the, this future I live in. The power is by the people, and um, the people are from the land. So, do you think it's possible, Elias? Because we seem to have such a desire. I think it's just a, a biology that we have, like almost like apes. We want to kind of you know dominate other others. So do you think it really is possible for us to have this kind of a community or society? What would it take? Um, I really believe it's possible. First uh, uh, thing what we have to do is um, tear down, down all walls and open our borders. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I um, experienced by myself that it's possible. I'm self um, moving in groups which are uh, very based, organized, uh, grassroot organizations, organized uh, groups. And um, it's a very equal and um, open hearted communities. So you see it, you actually see it happening. And, yeah, and that, that encourages happening. you. Fantastic. Mayor, go ahead. I feel uh, we should bring back our predators. 
<clears throat> you see, uh, your strength is my strength when we are fighting a common enemy, right? Uh, these days we are busy fighting each other because we have we don't have any more predators who can. So this is like Jurassic them. Park. You get back the dinosaurs and uh, we have yeah. all the lines. Maybe together. we need not engineer our predators, but we still <laughs> need need some. Uh, I'm a systems thinker, so like I call myself systems thinkers. So if I have to build a theory around it, I would say that we are eliminating our predators. We have eliminated our predators. So the nature is creating a new predator for us. It's called climate change. Now, if climate change is the new predator for us, the fundamental question I have is that the fight against climate change, will it unite us or divide us? Or the other way of asking the same question is, uh, when we are fighting climate change, are we fighting it together or are we fighting it uh, individually? Because if you're doing it individually, then you're coping. And coping being brings a bit of a stress. Uh, but if are we adapting? Are we co-creating the future that we want to create? Uh, that is resting on the grounds of collective action, which is a difficult thing to do when you have such a big society as the global world. And what kind of consciousness do you need? What kind of ethics do you need when you're living in such a big time and space curve where the amount of plastics that we have deposited in the oceans are now coming back to feed us as food from fish or the plastics that we find in the table salt. Now, our actions and reactions have such a big time delay that the actions done five decades back or over five decades is coming back to haunt us. Uh, these kind of time space curves are really fooling us. In a small geography where you're living with a community and all of you are working with communities, our actions create reactions uh, pretty fast, almost in real time. That's how the governance works there, saying you flush out a waste and it'll be staying in your backyard and perhaps be spoiling your food that you eat. Uh, and then you find ways of creating compost or regenerating your local systems. But here we have a global system where we all are enjoying the benefits of the fruits of the global commons, but nobody is being responsible for it. So how do we allocate responsibility in the system? Is it by force? Is it by hierarchy? Or uh, is it through a process of collective action because we have to fight a common enemy? Uh, those are the questions I struggle with. Uh, and then I also question uh, this whole business of globalization, uh, saying we need to find local solutions to global problems because global problems exist in local areas as much as we think that it's a universal problem, it's also a personal problem. So as we're coming to the close of uh, this session, I'd like each one of you to think of a question that you'd like uh, the audience to stay with, a powerful question, uh, which for you is, uh, it's a living question, it's a living inquiry, right? So please think of this, what can be a living question for all, all of us? And while they're thinking of that, I just want to share from my perspective, I lived as a Buddhist monk for many years, and one of the things I realized in that journey is, between stimulus and response is this gap, is this silence. And this is not just an empty silence, this is a very rich silence. And like Einstein said, you cannot solve one level of problem from the same level of consciousness that created it. You've got to go to the next level of consciousness. So for me, the solution comes from accessing the silence in whatever way you do it. You do it through art, you do it through meditation, you do it through yoga, whatever way that gets you to that silence. And that's where the intuition comes, the guidance comes, the enthusiasm comes. And honor that, trust that, and that's what's going to take us forward. So, Ganga Devi, do you want to share what is the question you want to leave all of us with? Sure. So, um, I, for a, a little bit of context, uh, one of the concepts that drives me the most in all of my work is the idea of integrity. And I uh, kind of, the first question is really asking, I ask people all the time, what does integrity mean to you? Um, because that really can shape how you make your decisions moving forward. But then the question underneath that question that I think is perhaps one of the most important questions for us to continuously be revisiting every single day, every hour, every breath that we take is what is truly sacred to you? So that's, that's the question I leave you with now. And I'd like to know the answer throughout this coming week. Beautiful. And I love that because, uh, you know, I read an article about how more than sustainability, we have to see things. The sustainable is still the, the mindset of how can I use 
And just how can I use things endlessly? <laughs> it's still the using mindset. So there was an article I read, I think it was by Llewellyn uh, Vaughan Lee, and he said that it's, it's not about sustainability, it's about seeing the sacredness. And this was there in our traditions. A totally powerful question. Mayor, what's your question? I have many questions. <laughs> uh, and uh, every day I manufacture new questions for myself. That's my livelihood. I'm a researcher. But the question I have is, like, uh, Delhi was a gas chamber a week back. So people were asking me, how do you solve the problem? And I told them that's the wrong question to ask. Because you can't be asking a question of how to do things the right way if you're doing wrong things. And we have been continuously doing wrong things and then trying to do them the right way. Uh, you can't really solve the problem, right? Uh, that's the wrong question to ask. Uh, so my question here is, how do we not do wrong things uh, instead of thinking of how do we do things the right way? Wow. How do we not do wrong things? All right. Go ahead, Elias. Mm. I have more uh, about two questions in my mind. The first, and first question is uh, for all the people who are working in governments. And um, yeah, the first question is how? Can I um, empower the people, the folks? Yeah. On well, my second uh, question um, is how uh, we can stop to see uh, the climate crisis as a problem, thus, then as the change as it is, and how we can ad uh, adapt this change to ourselves. How can we stop seeing it as a problem and seeing it as a change, is that what you're saying? Yeah. And how can we adapt ourselves to this change? Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Go ahead, Crystal. What consistent change can you make to bring joy, compassion, love, co peace and harmony to yourself, to your community and to the world? What yeah. consistent change can you make what that will bring joy, peace, and harmony to your community and to your world? Yes. Can you give an example from your life? What is one consistent change that did it yeah. for you? Um, for me, it's changing what I eat and making sure that when I am eating, it's not just like about animals, but making sure I, like what I when I purchase something that it is I'm doing it from a place of compassion. I know that like a lot of the food that is grown. Is you, labor is used that is not, um, it's not fair labor. Right. But thinking also about thinking about like, so even not just animals, but like palm oil, like not using palm. And so I'm very conscious about what I purchase. I'm very, I read everything. And so I'm very conscious about um, the impact of what I purchase, how right. it impacts other people. Beautiful. All right, so people have gone through many hours of listening to a lot of things. And I just want to end by saying that a single thought can change your life. But too many thoughts will change your life. <laughs> so uh, from all the things we've shared and all the other wonderful panelists have shared in today's morning session, I would love for you to keep one clean idea that stays with you. And don't just keep it at the idea level. Like we said, the heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. So as we think it till we feel it, and we feel it till we are it. And let's all take the flame. Each one of these people are very inspiring in their own domains, and they're sharing the spark of what they've got. So let each one of us imbibe it within us to brighten the spark in our heart. And like this, like what's that lovely dance that we did, and sharing the light in the world. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. And thank you, each one of you. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Good. We're done. Thank you, wonderful discussions. Okay, so we, are, um, we have a lot of food for thought, a lot of questions that is cropping up, um, but we're going to close this session uh, with a few closing words. So from the organizers, Dina. Well, I'm very glad that we ended uh, really where we need to begin with questions. So this was um, a wonderful opening to our time together. For those of you who just came for the morning, I hope you got to experience a little bit of what our uh, work is about, what our convenings are about. 
I think we got a good sense of it from this morning. And um, um, in the next few days, all of you who've come to join this uh, gathering uh, will have a chance to um, express yourself and to be building. We always begin by trying to uh, build the spiritual container that will hold us over, over the next few days. And I think we're able to do that even in this formal setting. We always are a little worried about the formalities that we have to abide by because we um, really like just to jump right in. But I think even within the formal setting, we've been able to awaken the spirit that's going to guide us. So thank you all who've participated in this morning, for those of you who've shared with us. Um, I think it's a wonderful way to begin. And thank you for those who've joined us for the morning. Uh, we're very grateful. Thank you, Dina. Uh, so, of course, all of these couldn't happen without uh, my teacher, Master Sheng Yen, and of course, also without sponsors to support the financial uh, part of this entire program over the past uh, four years. And we actually, they're not able to make it here today, uh, but they have written some remarks that I would ask um, Guo Chan to read this on their behalf. Good morning, distinguished guests and friends. We are sorry we are not able to join you for the gathering today. I have deep admiration for you. In spite of the enormous challenges of this work, you carry out yourself with resolute dedication, commitment, and perseverance because this is the right thing to do. I recall that when my husband was still alive, he often took our family to visit Damajan Mountain, DDM for short, and engage with DDM's work to benefit people and society. My son and daughter naturally developed a deep connection with DDM and its founder, Master Shen Yan. Although both my husband and Master Shen Yan are no longer in their earthly bodies, however, their legacy of doing the right thing still lives within me. I recall when Master Shen Yan was alive, he often apologized to the young people because his generation left behind a not very healthy earth. He expressed his gratitude to the young people for their willingness to work together to improve the environment that we all live in. Likewise, I would like to pass this baton on to you. We have to face humanity's wrongdoing to Mother Earth and commit to building a healthier environment. May we one day no longer need to apologize to future generations for leaving an unhealthy Earth to them. Therefore, my daughter, Yili, and I are both very grateful to Master Shen Yan for giving us wonderful opportunities to join in global conferences on the environment, peace, and women issues so that we could collaborate with the people around the world committed to bringing a change and learn from each other. There is a Chinese proverb. It takes more than one cold day for a river to freeze three feet deep. The unhealthy condition of Mother Earth did not arise overnight. We have ignored and hurt her over a long period of time. As a result, this difficult task may take numerous generations to rectify. It is not easy to accomplish this, and we might not live long enough to see the success. Inevitably, there will be many obstacles and difficulties on the journey. However, we all have to take the lead to persist and pass this legacy onto future generations. This way, our descendants would possess more advanced spirituality and inherit a better environment in order to coexist with Mother Earth. Dear young friends, 
It is not easy for you to take the first step, and I sincerely appreciate your dedication, commitment, and compassion. Lastly, I would like to share with you an advice that my teacher, Master Shen Yan, often gave. He said, "In order to make others happy, you must first know how to make yourself happy. When you wish to care for the health of others, you have to first let yourself be healthy." Therefore, we all need to take care of ourselves by elevating our spirituality, so that we can cultivate the inner wisdom and the capacity needed to build a better world. I would like to again express my gratitude to my teacher, Master Shen Yan, my husband and children, as well as Venerable Guo Chan and Chang Ji, for their dedication with this work around the world. And of course, Damajang Mountain. Let us continue to work together to fulfill Master Shenyan's compassionate vow to help humans grow into their potential and build a better world. And I believe this is the common vow of humanity. On behalf of Lily and Ili Ho, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we will um, invite Mai Chi Sansani for some more closing words. ธรรมสวัสดีค่ะเรากลับมาที่ลมหายใจในปัจจุบันขณะแล้วตั้งคําถามกับตัวเองว่าเราจะเห็นแก่ตัวน้อยลงได้หรือไม่แล้วลองเริ่มตั้งคําถามกับตัวเองอีกครั้งหนึ่งว่าเราจะให้ได้มากกว่าที่เคยให้ได้มากหรือเปล่าสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะสวัสด
เราขอบคุณทุกสรรพชีวิตที่เกิดขึ้นอีกครั้งหนึ่งเมื่อชีวิตของเราได้เฉียบตายนะคะคนที่เคยเฉียบตายก็จะรู้ว่าชีวิตที่เหลือเราจะเห็นแก่ตัวน้อยลงและเพราะเราได้รู้ว่าความตายเดินเข้ามาถึงเราอย่างคนที่จะไม่ตายทั้งเป็นก็คือเราต้องให้ได้มากกว่าที่เคยให้ฉะนั้นการตั้งคำถามกับตัวเองแล้วเปลี่ยนแปลงตัวเองอยู่ในทุกๆวันก็จะทำให้โลกภายนอกเปลี่ยนไปด้วยค่ะ So thank you very much and um, as I've been get close to the death because of the illness that we have so we realize that What should we do for the rest of our life? If you come back to yourself, you probably know that you have a certain terms of life that is limited. What would you like to do? What? How can I give it more and more? So um, please come back to yourself and have a question on yourself. Uh, in the one year, one year after the i l l n e s s เราก็ตั้งคำถามกับตัวเองทุกวันแล้วเราก็รู้ว่าเราปลูกแค่เพียงต้นไม้ต้นเดียวไม่ได้เราต้องปลูกชีวิตของผู้คนเราจึงปลูกป่าปลูกชีวิตและที่สำคัญกว่าชีวิตก็คือปลูกหัวใจของผู้รับใช้คือหัวใจของโพธิสัตว์ As I have as I have been go through the cancer Is a kind of like um, one of the um, big issue in our life. So I realized that I cannot only help only myself, but there's so many lives that need to be helped also. So that's why I'm starting to do more work, and we cannot only start in ourselves. We can start to help other sentient being as well, including all the trees and. Everything surround us, so we starting to plant not only the plant trees, but actually to cultivate the bodhisattva heart, the heart of giving of people, and also for them to be able to help with humanity. หัวใจของโพธิสัตว์คือหัวใจที่ต้องเดินไปรับใช้ไม่ใช่รอที่จะรับใช้ฉะนั้นอยากให้ทุกขันได้ยืนขึ้นแล้วเดินไปจับมือกับคนทุกคนที่ท่านอยากจะรับใช้ The heart of giving is not waiting for somebody to wake you up. The heart of giving is to walk and then to go and then to do something together. I would like you all to stand up and then hand in hand with the people next to you. เราจะไม่ยืนเพื่อจะรอให้ใครมาถึงเราแต่เราจะเดินออกไปจับมือกับคนทุกคนในห้องนี้เพื่อจะทำคอนเนคชันที่จะทำให้เกิดการเปลี่ยนแปลงในโลกนี้เราจะเดินเข้ามาเป็นวงกลมเดียวกันทุกคนจะออกไปแตะมือของคนที่อยู่ข้างหลังเราให้ได้ So as a giver we are not waiting for somebody to give us so we are walking to hand in hand to make a group one big circle Dina please here so can we make a one circle Everybody hand in hand to each other, and this is a real world that we can change. Yeah, we can make one circle, please. Okay. So would you please be here and? Okay. Would you mind, please? Yeah. Yeah. Please go this way. Yeah. So we're gonna make one circle as the world that connecting to each other. ถ้าเราอยากให้เกิดการเปลี่ยนแปลงเราต้องเดินเข้าไปหาในจุดอ่อนของทุกทีเพื่อที่จะทำให้จุดนั้นแข็งแรง If we like to have to make change in the world we have to walk to connect to people so this is the world that connect to each other ให้เราให้พลังงานจากมือของเราที่มีหัวใจของเราเต้นไปรับรู้ความรู้สึกของคนที่อยู่ข้างๆเราที่ก็มีหัวใจที่กำลังเต้น So please um, listen to your heartbeats and then feel the hands that you connect to the next the person 
next to you feel the feelings of that ถ้าเราฟังหัวใจของเราเต้นอย่างมีสติเราจะให้อภัยคนที่อยู่ข้างๆเราแม้ว่าคนคนนั้นจะน่ารักหรือไม่น่ารักแต่ความรักของเราจะกลายเป็นปุ๋ยที่ลดน้ำคนดินชีวิตของเราให้เปลี่ยนแปลงแล้วโลกนี้ก็จะเปลี่ยนแปลง If we open our heart enough so we have no prejudice towards anybody in front of us and then that is create love that it for, can forgive anything so please have your mind open and then share your happiness through your hands would you please turn this way and then hands over the hand hand over the shoulder of the person in front of you พี่ตีเปิดเลยค่ะ Love through the hand and do a little massage, gentle massage, to the person in front of you. เดินเข้ามาข้างในนะคะเด็กๆเดินเข้ามาข้างในวงSend our love through our hand to make the pre- person in front of you happiest as possible. Okay, so please step forward in inside of the circle. Step one step inside of the circle. Okay, so that you get in closer um, circle. Person in front of you are happy what you are doing. Okay, please turn around. So take, don't get revenge though. <laughs> so, so the happiness through our hands, and come back to your back. This is how the world will be if we give. We get returned somehow. Person in front of us is not so nice, so make sure that you can be able to give. <laughs> so please, forgiving of whatever that you see or you experiences. So we can hug the person next to us with our hearts. So please, giving our love to the next person next to you. We will ask that the people of our world have a part in this celebration. ISV of our next generation will do the work with us.
So we have the our teenage that age 10 to 16. They are here to receive the message that they are going to work for the world. Okay. okay. So ISV. Okay. So they would love to give to sing some song for you. This is the message that they would like to do. Mm -hmm. Be All right, so our delegates are up here? Okay.
dance, dance, wherever you may be. Why is the world of the dance We would invite everyone else to come.